Hi everyone. Hello. Welcome, <laughs> tea goers. This is our uh, second theme tales of the season. I'd like to start by acknowledging that this program is taking place in the unceded territory territory of Little Watt Nation. Uh, my name is Nikki Madigan, and I'm the curator. Thanks for coming and supporting this program. And if you missed the legendary tale last week about the Little Wet Cattle Drive, you can see it on our website and YouTube channel as of today. Our theme this year is Myths and Legends. And we're featuring speakers from Little Wet, Mount Curry, Pemberton, Squamish, and beyond. Pemberton's been a place name on European maps for 160 years this summer. Prior to this, it was and remains the traditional territory of the Little Wat peoples. To celebrate the depth of history in this place, we pick the theme of myths and legends, as these stories tend to be the most informative about our past. A myth tells us why things are the way that they are, and a legend tells us how we were. This season, we have stories that fit in both of these categories, and perhaps a few that fit in between. And just a reminder to all of you in attendance that we do film these for the historical record, and uh, an edited version will be put on YouTube and our website. Today we have Elder and Cultural Resource Technician with Little Watt Nation, Lex Joseph, who's going to tell us some stories of creation. Lex was born in 1956 in Little Watt, BC, and he grew up in Mount Curry. He works with Little Watt Nation as a Cultural Resource Technician. During the day, he can be found doing a multitude of things from guiding groups on field trips to researching First Nations customs and rituals. Lex also does hikes with groups, helping to identify traditional use of plants. And he helps ensure the protection of archaeological and cultural sites. Lex has come today to share stories that are anchored in the landscape of the traditional territory of the Lilwa, stories that illustrate that the people in the land are one. Thank you, Lex, for coming. Good afternoon, Pemberton. In our local Mook's language, uh, the term Pemberton is uh, Mukuma, up north way is the translation. And uh, this term uh, became so during the 1940s when uh, a lot of members of the Montgomery band used to come into Pemberton to harvest potatoes for the local farmers. Some of the, I have five stories to read for you for today and mostly to do with creation and uh, there may be two stories of the uh, same story. Today I want to tell you, read you a story called The Flood. This story was told at first by Chief James Stager and he told the story to James Tate who did the recording. The Flood and the Distribution of People. All the little people lived together around Green Lake and for some distance below it on the Green River. At that time there came the great and continuous rain which made all the lakes and rivers overflow their banks and deluge the surrounding country. When the people saw the water rise far above the ordinary high water mark, they became afraid. A man called in Chinkin had a very large canoe in which he took refuge with his family. The other people ascended the mountain for safety, but the water soon covered them too. When they saw that they would probably all drown, so they begged and cheated them to save their children, as for themselves they did not care. The canoe was too small to hold everyone, but it could hold the children, so Chinookin took one child from each family, a male from one family, a girl from another, and so on. The rain continued falling and the water rising and all the land had submerged except that the, the peak of the high mountain called in Chuck split that's at the lower end of the little lake and it's still there today. The canoe drifted above until the waters receded and grounded on Schmimich Mountain. Schmimich Mountain is in uh, a high mountain just there above Mount Curry and today we call it Father Rock. Each each stage of the water flooding left marks on the sides of this mountain. And that's why we call it scrimmage, which means written. The strata stri stri lines are uh, the one uh, still visible today. 
piece case of water seemingly left marks on the sides of this mountain. When the ground was dry again, the people set, settled just out, opposite, outside of the present site of Pemberton. And we call that Goodlock 49. It's a big Indian village there, and that's where the, the people settled. And Chino came with his wife and children settled there, and he made the young people marry one another, and he sent them to Paris to settle all the good places throughout the country. Some were sent back to Green Lake and Green River, while others were sent down to Little Little Lake and along the Lower Little River. And some were sent up to Anderson Lake and Seton Lake. Thus was the country people, but the offspring of the Green Lake people. And that's the first story of the flood. At this time, I'll entertain any questions on this particular story. The Lot 49, where is that now? It's in Mount Curry, over by the Polyard, where we're building a new Hill College now. Okay, okay. Directly across there to the east is the Woodlot 49. Yeah. Is there any more questions? Okay. The second story is by another one of our chiefs, Chief Baptist Ritchie. He told this story about 1971 to the team of the Bouchard and Kennedy in the BC Indian Language Project. This is a true story that has been told to the Mount Curry people for many, many years. When I was a young man, the old, old, old people told me this story many times. A long time ago, one of my ancestors, whose name was in Chinookin, received from advice from the great chief. He was told that the land was going to flood, and almost all the mountains would be covered with water. The great chief gave in Chinookin some instructions, buying together all the drifter that you can find. These old young little settlers to do this. Uh, the trees that were fallen that still had roots on them. That's what they used to intertwine. The roots and the branches were what held the, the raft together. After he had gathered all the people together and Chin Kim told him what the great chief had told him, to cedar bark and red wool into a long rope, for we will have to anchor on to the top of Inchuk Mountain at the southeast end of Little Lake. When you have made enough rope, the great chief will tell me. The great chief told him Chin Kim to advise the people that they should collect all the salmon oil that they could when the fish came up the river. And Chin Kim had the control of the salmon run because he made the fish weird. Although he could not see the great chief, and Chin Kim believed in the advice that he received. After the people had filled the raft with anchor ropes, and Chin told them to load the salmon oil onto it, he knew that it would be a long time before the water receded. The great chief was taking care of his people whom he had placed on earth. And Chief Kim knew that the salmon row would provide enough nourishment until they were able to gather food after the flood. The brother of Chief Kim began to question what he was doing. Why did he place all that rope on the raft? Look at all the space it has taken. And Chin Kim looked at his brother and replied, I haven't been given orders from the great chief. When the flood comes, my raft will float over to and Chuck Mountain, and I will anchor onto the peak. Back in the early days, probably maybe around 1930, there was some uh, advice from the native people from Skookumchuk that the anchor log was still in there, and indeed when the priest went up, the log that was holding the anchor was still there. I will anchor onto the peak. Why not use animal hides to braid into a rope? You don't think it was much space. I'm going to braid a rope that is the same length as yours, but made from hides. The brother of Chin can made a raft and long rope from the, of animal hides. A man named Kushpitsa, who Chin can accepted as a brother, took his daughter and son to Chin Kim and asked him to look after them. All the children who were old enough to take care of themselves were allowed onto the raft. It began to rain, it rained and rained, and the water rose until they could no longer hold the raft. All the canoes and rafts flowed with the water. The children who hadn't been put on the raft sat on logs and in smaller canoes. Eventually they reached the Chuck Mountain. And Chin Kim told his brother to 
anchor to the truck. When the water goes down, you'll need a long rope to keep it secure until the ref finally rests. They both fasten their ropes to the chucks. It is not known how long the people are anchored to this mountain peak, but the Chinkins brothers anchor rope, which is made of animal hides, stretched until it broke. He floated away because the water was moving so fast. The water receded quickly, and the Chinkins raft floated down until it stopped on the sloping area of the mountain. This was where the great chief had told the Chinkin they would land. Everything was covered with mud. And Chinkin decided that the children of Kushtitsa would, would best be able to provide for themselves at Skukumchuk, the day we call Chikatiin. So he left them there. The descendants of these children are today called Skager, an anglicized pronunciation of Kushtitsa. And Chinkin placed the people where he felt they could best take care of themselves. Everyone had enough dried salmon rock to keep them from going hungry. After a while, the king returned to Mount Piri. The meadows here were better than after the meadows here were better after the flood. He found that a lot of people had moved to Mount Piri because their land is now covered with rocks and settled along the Willowat River. Before the white people came to this land, they were there were prophets who were the leaders of our people. They received advice from the great chief. We now call him God. And Jim King was one of these prophets. I, that's this great chief from Mount Perry, now have the name Jim King. And that's uh, the story of the blood from the chief that is great chief. If there's any questions on this story, I'd like to answer them right now. What was Mount Curry called? Both the town and the mountain. <laughs> it's well, the mountain here is the zill. Slides on the mountain. And the town? The, the town of Mount Perry is Sklalik. Okay. That's it. How did the name Curry come to be? The name Mount Curry comes from the, the old American settler John Curry. Okay. He used to live up here beside the uh, where Dr. Moody used to live, just up the way there. He used to live there. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. I was wondering. Um, the people here speak of the flood and in the Fraser Valley and hope they speak of the flood. Um, um, do the coastal people and Queen Charlotte's speak many, of the flood? Many native tribes have their own story of the flood, yeah. as well as the Squamish and uh, but we most of the flood stories come from the coastal, whether they're here or here in Mockery or the Fraser Valley or Squamish or the you know, places along the coast, but we hardly hear many stories of the flood from the interior tribes. Oh. Yeah. Any more oh. questions? Is the log anchor still visible? The log anchor was still visible in, in, into the 1930s, but the, the note says uh, the priest destroyed the log, and the, but the, the chips of the log still should be still in place yet, and if we could be found, we could most likely get an age out of it. The children that were taken during that flood, were they ever reunited with their families? Or no, uh, like the families? story says, uh, some of the children whose name was Kushtitsa, they were left in Skokumchuk where the Inchin can make the boy marry the girl and, oh. and so on. As well as uh, different villages like the village in Mount Perry or uh, even in Darcy where they also settled some people. So their parents, uh, they passed away or they died in the flood? Yeah, uh, uh, mostly all the people, including the animals and fishes and birds, died in the, in the big flood. In keeping with the story of creation, I have another story of creation. This is called Etsima, or the story of the Transformers. This is a story by the James Tate. And this story comes from 1906. Four brothers called the Esimel came up from the mouth of the Fraser River. They were accompanied by their sister who was endowed with magic and also by another transformer called Spade. 
It is said that these people came from somewhere, someplace on the coast and entered the interior by the way of the Fraser River for the purpose of putting things right in the world and killing everything that was bad. These six persons were gifted with magic in a high degree and they traveled by canoe. After performing many wonderful deeds on their way up the Fraser River, they entered the Harrison River and camped a few miles above where the Chehalis tribe lived. And that's a he doesn't write the word jail, it's very good, but I translated it into jail for, for the story. Here abode a wicked woman who was gifted with magic and killed many men. Kate said he would go alone and visit the woman. But the brothers told him that he better avoid her until the next day when they would all go together. Kate answered him, why should I avoid her? No one is superior to me in magic. So when the other slept, he went, in, went to her house and said to her, why have you no husband? It is bad for you to be alone. I am seeking a, wish, I am seeking a wife and wish to have you. Let me alone and don't make me feel ashamed by talking in that way. But Skate insisted and tried to do violence to her. His hand was caught by her organ and since he was unable to withdraw, he had to cut it off above the wrist. He felt ashamed and went home and lay down in the morning. Others told him to get up, and, but he would not rise, he asked him, show your hands, and he showed him one hand, he said, show us the other one. But what he did was he transferred the hand to the other side and tried to show him and tried to convince the guy that this is other hand. He used the other one, he changed his hand to the other side of his body and showed it again. They knew what had happened and laughed at him. Then he went to the woman's house and the brothers tried to transform her. But in vain, for she was equal to them in power. Therefore they asked their sister to help them, and she pushed her hand and arm into the woman's organs. When she pulled them out again, the woman died at once. After some time, they arrived halfway up Harrison, Harrison Lake, where they saw a house in which lived a old man named Seki. They entered his house and talked to him jokingly, as if he were the child. He became angry and said, why do you talk to me as if I were a child? I'm an old man, have more experience than you who are young. Even their sister in the house, he proposed to the old man that they should walk up to the mountainside and see if he could climb the best. When they were quite a distance away, the old man, because the heavy rain was heavy fall of snow, fastened on his snowshoes, which he had hidden under his clothes, left the brothers, and walked home. It took the others three days the way through the deep snow to the house and as soon as they reached it, the snow all disappeared. Then they asked the old man to take them up to the lake in his canoe, which was very small. They all embarked and the old man paddled. When they had gone some distance, they tried to fight him and said, see that monster coming up beneath the canoe? He looked and said, that is nothing, that is only a shadow of the mud tops moving in the waves. Then they then he said, see that man paddling under the, underneath the canoe? The old man answered, it is nothing, it's only my shadow. Then Skate changed himself into a mink and went through the water. Uh, others told him to look. He said, oh, that's it's nothing. All kinds of animals swim in the lake. Then Skate transformed himself into a weasel. And entering the canoe, ran up over the old man's legs. The brother said, look at that bad animal, but the old man answered, that is nothing, I can easily kill him with my paddle. Now they reached a place called Shatta, where there was a long sandy beach. Here they proposed to run the old man a race. They were to run to the end of the beach and back again. They left their sister in the canoe and began to race. The old man beat them and reached the canoe again while the others were yet far away. He caused a, a calm with the intense heat to come, just like today. And uh, which made the, his opponents hardly able to walk. At last they sat down, overcome by the heat. So the old man said to the women, we'll take the canoe to meet them for they are tired. Then he made a breeze and the brothers and Skate Feeling refreshed, proposed to the old man that they should go up the mountain to gather some cedar branches. 
when he turned around to look up the mountain to propose to climb, the sister threw on his back the paint which he had used when pubescent. He was immediately turned to stone, which can be still seen today, the present day. Today, this is called the, the doctor of Harrison Lake, and he's still there. And he stands about so tall, and he's got the part of his body is painted red, and his eyes are painted red. After this, across the opposite side of the lake, where Sekhti's wife lived, her name was Shkayam. They had turned her and her canoe to, to stone for she was a wicked woman. The transformers proceeded on a voyage and entered the lower and lower river. They proceeded slowly up this river and performed many wonderful feats, killing and transforming bad people and making bad parts of the country better. At last they arrived halfway below the lake on the west side, which they saw a house in front of which a pregnant woman was standing. They asked her where her husband was and she pointed on the lake shore where he was engaged trying to catch fish with two sticks. The fish would pass between the sticks and he would take them out and wipe the slime off, then with grass and try again. The man's name was Tzolk. Tzolk today is uh, what we call a vulture. So these stories, they use many different languages and animals to, to name their uh, characters after. And this one, Tzolk, is a vulture. And the transformer asked what he was doing. He answered, I am poor and ignorant. I know not how to catch fish. I tried to catch him in the manner you had just seen, but they never catch, captured me. They said, what do you eat? He answered, we gather grass and boil it in baskets and eat it when it is cooked. They noticed that the man had carried a long knife on his back with strings of eagle feathers attached to the handle and sheath and asked him what he used it for. When my, when my wife becomes a very large child, I take this knife, cut open her belly with it, take the child out. My wife I always dies because I have had many wives. They said, we will teach you how to do things right so that future generations in this country shall know. They crossed the lake and pulled out hairs out of their legs from below the knee, put you through on the ground, spats and bushes grow out, blew up at once. This place is called Driftwood Bay still there today, and a lot of people were camping there. They stripped the bark from some of them, some of them and went to the man and wife and showed them how to prepare it, twist it into twine and weave it into nets. They made a dip net for them and showed them how to fish with it. Everything they did, they made the couple do themselves so that they should really know how to do it. Then one of the brothers, unperceived by the man and his wife, changed himself into salmon and entered the man's net. The man landed it and the other brother showed him how to cut it up. They lighted the fire, heated the stones. And then they placed a large basket with a small basket side by side and filled them with water. They put the fish in the large one and they lifted the stones with the tongs and dipped them into a small kettle. They cleaned them and they dropped them into the large kettle. The stones are red hot and this is how they boiled the, the water and made, made the salmon cook. He added fresh stones until the fish were boiled. Then they put it onto some cedar bark and all joined in and eaten it. They told the man to save all the bones and throw them back into the water, which they did. And their other brothers were told to return to his former shape and join them. They said, future generations shall do as we have shown. They shall catch and boil salmon and eat them instead of grass. When the man's wife became to be delivered of her child. The sister took bird cherry bark and tied it to the infant. She pulled twice, but the rope broke, e broke each time. She tied it again, and with the third pull, the child came out. The transformer said, future generations shall give birth to their children, and men shall no longer have to cut their wives open. Occasionally, there may be a hard birth when the child needs to be pulled out. And that's what the transformers had showed the man in my. Mosque said, This man has killed many women, he ought to be punished. And the brother said, He should be turned into stone so that future generations, by seeing him, may remember the cause of his transformation and know what has been ordained. They turned 
into stone, which may be still seen at the present day, but his wife and his newly born son, they love to occupy the place. And this is a beginning village today. Proceeding up the lake, the Transformers came to its head, into which an upper little river flowed. Here there was a, a flat ground like a bog which moved up and down and hindered the canoes from entering the river. They made a firm but swampy land and up the channel by which the canoes might reach the river. Today we call this the Low Lake Rodeo Grounds. And then from the Low Lake Rodeo Grounds to the lake, there was two channels, both made by the Transformers, and they were made by the Transformers so that they, they could reach the lake with, without having to go through the bushes and be hindered. At this place, they saw a man sitting at work, finishing a handle of a spear. He had his mouth puckered up and he was whistling to himself. They asked him what he was doing, and he answered, It is none of your business. They asked again, and he said, I heard of these transformers coming, and I'm making the spear, and then the spear him in the neck. He said, Let's see the spear. It looks very nice. He handed it to them, and then he threw it into the water, speared him with the spear. He said, your name shall be whitefish, and the future generations shall spirit you in this matter and eat you food. That is one of the transformations that they made to help the people with their food ventures, and this is called the Kusli whitefish. The whitefish has a very small mouth because he was whistling on transform. The transformers joined the Continued to journey up the Lower River to a place near Pemberton, and then up the Pole River. The Pole River is a Burke Head River. Until they reached a place on the river known as Salmon House. Here they saw a man leaning forward and gazing intently into the water. They asked him, what are you looking at? And he, and he answered, it is nothing to you. They watched him and saw that he was catching fish with his hands. He caught on and they asked him how he ate it. He never answered, but putting the fish to your mouth, you got to eat it raw. Thus he transferred me to the fish hawk. Yochala. He said, henceforth people shall not catch fish with their hands nor eat them raw. Ascending the river, they passed its source and came to the lake of Tsukala now, which is Gates Lake. At the source of the stream, it empties into the head of Anderson Lake. He then went onto some rocks where the old Indian trail passed and sat down to rest. One brother went away and returned from the south, dressed in cedar bark, painted red, and carrying cedar bark and other things in a bundle on his back. Another brother went away and returned from the east, dressed only in a breech cloud, and carrying on his back a, bed, a bundle of spats and bark and other things. When they appeared to view the other transformer, the other one from the south is little bit, and the one from the east is Stratum, saying, henceforth, the little shall go to the Fraser River in the Stratum country to buy salmon and spats and bark, and the Stratum shall visit the little to trade with them. And one of the transformers stamped his foot in the rock, and left the imprint of his soul, saying, this footprint shall mark the spot as the tribal boundary between the little and Stratum. And the rock is still there, and every few years we go out to see it. And just across the road is a gold rush uh, uh, hotel. And the foundation is still there. And it's about this deep, I think. This footprint, this footprint shall mark the spot as a tribal boundary between the Lilith and the Stadt and the upper and lower Lilith. The footprint may be seen today at the present day. It is not certain where the transformers went after this, but it is said that they returned to get to the home country by the way of Pemberton and Green Lake to the Squamish. I'd like to answer any questions, if there's any questions on this legend. Can you repeat what you said about the rodeo grounds and the river? The rodeo grounds. There's one river on this side yeah. that you can see, that's Birkenhead River. Right? Uh, before uh, the lowering of Lilith Lake, there was uh, two channels that used to come up from the lake used to come up on both sides of the road and kind of the road was built up to a certain height and uh, during the 60s uh, the two channels were still there and it was a lowering of the low lake and uh, causing the... Uh, oh, so the other one's gone now. 
the the one that's gone, and, well, the one kind of stayed right there, and it's still kind of sandy today. But the other one is uh, completely dried up and uh, no longer visible. Any more questions? I'll continue with another story, story number four. This is the story of the salmon men, or the origin of salmon. Two brothers lived at the very headwaters of the upper low river and spent most of their time training themselves in the neighboring mountains where they wished to become great. <coughs> One of them became ill and had to remain at home. After four years of illness, he became weak and so thin that he seemed nothing but skin and bones. His brother grew anxious about them and stopped his training. He hunted in and brought in rabbits, squirrels, and all kinds of meat for his sick brother. He also threw a small pieces of stick into the water, making them turn into fish. Then he caught them and gave them to his brother to eat. But no kind of food seemed to agree with the invalid, for he rapidly grew thinner. When the youth saw that no food did his brother good, he made up his mind to take him away to some other place to be cured. He embarked in the canoe and proceeded down the little river, giving names to all the places they passed along until they came to a place called Bilamuk. Here there was a rock which was down the river and made it through to allow the canoes to pass. This is the Keyhole Falls. Even at the present day it appears like a stone bridge across the river proceeding to a place called Bilamuk, north and south creek. Here two creeks running from opposite directions made each other a great force that the water they made the water smooth enough for the safe patches of safe place for the canoes to pass. Proceeded, they came to a place they named Kulakwin. Here there was a steep rocky mountain close to the river and they threw the medicine mat in it and became flat. The medicine mat is what a, a, a shaman would use to perform his uh, sacred ceremonies and he puts it on his face so that he, well, if he doesn't put it on his face, he could see your soul and he doesn't want to see your soul. He doesn't want to see anyone's soul. So he puts his uh, mask on so that he can perform the ceremony and still have things come out the way that, they, the way that they're intended. Thus they proceeded down to big and little lakes and the lower and lower river until they reached Harrison Lake. All the way along, he gave names to the places, made the waters navigable, and changed many features of the country. They reached Fraser River and went down to its mouth and proceeded out to sea to the land of the salmon. When they arrived there, the strong brother hid himself while the sick man transformed himself into a nice wooden dish painted and carved. And in this form, he floated against the dam in which the people kept the salmon. The man found the dish and took it to his daughter, who admired it very much and used, used it to eat from. Whatever salmon she left in the dish overnight always disappeared, but she did not care because salmon was plentiful. The dish ate the salmon, or rather the sick brother in the dish for him. And soon it became fat and well again. The, brother, the other brother left his hiding place every night to see the invalid and to eat salmon out of the basket, and who should people threw their leavings. He was glad to see his brother getting well so rapidly. When he had become very fat, his brother told him it was time they departed. So one night he broke the dam and let the salmon out. Then they embarked in their canoe and led the salmon towards the mouth of the Fraser River. The salmon traveled very fast and by the next morning they had reached the river. They ascended the river and took pieces of salmon from the baskets and threw them into their different creeks and rivers. Far over they threw pieces of salmon some of the fish followed, thus they introduced salmon into the streams of the interior. Henceforth, they said, salmon shall run at this time each year, and the people shall become acquainted with them and eat them. The brothers then returned to their home at the head of the upper low river and made their home in the hot springs called Chick, which they used for cooking their food. Chick is hot spring. Hot spring they were talking about is meager. Do we have any questions on the story of the Seven Brothers? Uh, 
salmon and fish is a large part of the stories. Yeah. And yet it seems that you live quite a ways away from rivers and Lake. Yeah, uh, in the past when uh, doing the fish surveys, uh, they found that coho were caught right at the mouth of Meager, Meager Creek. So even way up in the Log River, there's, there was salmon. And uh, at the Samson Creek, the, each year they, they do catch uh, coho salmon as well as sockeye salmon. Not in great numbers or anything, but there are salmon there. But they don't know how far up the river they go. Any more questions? One more question. What was the name of the place where the uh, where the, med the medicine got out? Where after North and South Creek and came further down, they traveled further down the river, and there was a spot where you said and put the medicine map out. Oh, there's a mountain there. Uh, the story. The story is a little bit mixed up. The, the actual the mountain that they call the rock is a little bit further upstream, but oh. with the story, it became a little bit further downstream. Oh, okay. Yeah. The last story I'd like to read for you folks today is called The Poor Men or the Origin of Copper. Former many people lived at Green Lake and its, in, and its vicinity. The only other people Known to them were some people who lived on the Lowell River. They did not know the coast Indians at that time. The Green Lake were visited by some disease and all died excepting an old woman and a grandson. They were very poor. The boy cried constantly. The old, old woman made a bow and arrow, a bark canoe, and many toys to which to amuse him. But he continued to cry as much as ever. She made a fish line of hair and taught him how to fish. This classified him and now he spent most of his time fishing. One day he caught something heavy and his line broke. He went home to his grandmother who made him a new line of hemp, which is spats and bark. She then put a ball of her own hair on the hook as bait. The boy was well pleased and went back to the same place to fish. He hooked something heavy again, but this time he had a strong line and was able to pull it out into a large piece of copper, a thing which people had never seen before. He rolled it up carefully in the brush and took it home. His grandmother saw that it was something rare and precious. She told him to lay it by, which he did. When the boy had grown a bit, he began to shoot many hummingbirds and other bright plumage birds, the skins of which he made into robes. When he reached the age of puberty, he began to hunt large game and became a great hunter. He killed many bears and deer and goats. And his grandmother spent many of her time making the skins into robes and making goat hair blankets and laying up a large supply of food. At the end of several years, the house was quite full of food, all kinds of robes of goat hair, goat skin, deer, bear, and marmot skins. Now the lad asked him, asked his grandmother what he should do with the, with the copper he had found. And she said, show it to the people. I think there are some people who live on the Lullwood River. One day, not long after this, while, while the lad was hunt, hunting on the western slopes of the Cascade Mountains, he met some strange men who said they were Squamish. The strangers left him in, the, in, their, in their own explorations, reached his grandmother's house, she was surprised to see them. He said they belonged to the sea and asked her what she was doing there all alone. She said she and her sons were the only ones left of the people of that region. Thus the coast Indians became known to them. Now the old woman said to the lad, our house is full, it is now time that we invited people. So he went to the Lola River and invited the people he found there. So he, he also journeyed to the coast invited the Squamish when all the guests had assembled. He went and got this copper, and the copper said to him, when you show me to the people, you must put feathers and down in your hair. Wear a feather blanket and carry a rattle in your hand. You must dance when you show me. The lad dresses directed and went. He showed, he showed the copper, he danced and sang a song of its origin and how he found it. He feasted the people many days and before their departure, 
He gave each one a present of a robe. They called him the chief. His fame spread up and down. When the lower Fraser people heard of him, one of the chiefs came and gave him his daughter to be the young man's wife. One of the Squamish chiefs also brought his daughter and gave, him to, gave her to him in marriage. The young man gave marriage presents of pieces of copper to his father-in-law by his two wives. He had many children, mostly sons, and, and the people from distant countries of hearing him and his sons visited them, bringing their daughters whom they married to his sons. For each daughter-in-law he gave a piece of copper, thus copper is distributed among all the tribes. The people who had received it valued it highly and not, would not part of it for it was rare and gave them higher standings among the people and they showed their copper. They all dressed in feathers and danced. The Shushua and the Thompson each married a daughter to the son of the Green Lake chief. Thus the Green Lake people became very numerous again and some of them moved further east and settled around Pemberton, Lowood Lake and in recent years the Green Lake Indians have left their region altogether and settled amongst the Pemberton Indians. Thank you for being here today. Those are the five stories that I've prepared for you. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for providing space, Nikki. I'd like to thank the people of Pemberton for a nice uh, welcome. They give, give us a little people for visiting. Now, are you are you reading the stories as Tate has written them down? Or as Tate has written them down, except for I explained some of the actions that they've taken. Yeah, so the coppers. Uh, these are the old stories that are quite readily available, and uh, our old people knew what copper was, and they would go out and, uh, and find it and use it in such a way as to be a precious metal. Not so much for its use, but for precious part of it. The place at Green Lake is where the uh, logging was across the lake from the highway? Yeah. 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 Any more questions? To close my remarks today, I'd just like to read a little bit of uh, information for you people. This, in this section it's called Ishkin Dwelling. In the summer it was time to construct an Ishkin, where only those who helped construct the Ishkin were allowed to sleep in it, live in it during the winter. The home may hold children, adults, and grandparents. And in one location where we measured the Ishkin, it was 48 feet across. In winter our clothes Clothing had to be first, while some of the poorer people had to wear cedar fiber as their clothing. In summer, hardly any clothes were worn except for breech cloth and leggings. And the leggings would protect against the mosquitoes. Grandparents did the daily teachings for it was a must to learn. If not, it was harder to continue life without the teachings of the grandparents. And again, I'd like to answer any questions or uh, general topics like of uh, Lua culture. You could answer them at this time. You speak about the flood. Uh, historically, was there a flood? Like, was that the phrase of We, Valley we continue, continue, uh, we like to consider it the same as a biblical flood. Oh. Yeah. Not a, not, a, thought, yeah. not a flood from the 100 years ago or 200 years, or yeah. like in generations ago. We, we were told uh, by somebody in Curry that there, was, there used to be a log across yes. the Van Syke Mountain. Uh, do you know if that's true or is that? Uh, according to some of the people from Skookumchuk, the priest went up there and destroyed the log that was holding the, the rope in place. And, uh, but, uh, from what I consider is that if you go up there, you should still be able to find pieces of the original log if there was such a thing. Yeah, I heard that maybe there was petrified wood. Petrified wood. Petrified wood lasts a long time, and uh, 
I, I think I've only seen one piece of what you probably did myself. So you, um, you know and you agree with that same story we heard. Yes. <laughs> Is the footprint that marks the boundary uh, a protected site? It's not so much protected, but uh, you like to use the social values to keep people from damaging it. I couldn't quite tell if one of the places that uh, the people went to was um, the, uh, the head of Harrison Lake, because um, in more modern times there was a community there when I guess the, the uh, gold people you know the story that the Transformers, they do uh, have some activities around the end, north end of Harrison Lake? Right. Yeah. yeah. We were very lucky uh, back in the 90s, I think it was. We were, it was organized and we were taken on a, you know, the people that lived down there took us all the way down to the head of Harrison Lake. Oh, yeah. We had a little tour and a talk about all that. I'm sorry I didn't bring any of the Transformers pictures, but the we do have a picture of the transformer that's uh, at the in the Port Douglas uh, right. area. Yeah. Okay. yeah. In the back there. How come the Lilla people refer to Mount Curry as Tizzle? Yes, on government maps, Tizzle is in the Joffrey group. Oh, Tizzle in the Joffrey group was named by a non-native man. Right. Tizzle named in the Okamilch or the Mount Curry people. Tazil is a Mount Curry mountain up here. Not only the peak, but also the slides that extend from beyond the peak to the right, as well as all the way to the left where the, where the big slide, as you can see, where, where the last slide ends, that whole area is Tazil, not just the mountain. Transformers touch Tazil. And then another story, similar story, they did go up Mount Curry mountain. As, uh, when you look up to the Mount Curry mountain, you see about three quarters of the way up, maybe a little bit higher, there's two pillars there, and the, those are two goat hunters that were changed into stone. So, were the Transformers in the Mount Curry Mountain Group the spiritual? The Transformers are spiritual, legendary, and mystical. Mm -hmm. yeah. And where would they come from? They came from the coast, and a lot of the coastal tribes also have stories of transformation, but as I said before, not so much stories of transformations in the interior of the British Columbia, where they have their own culture and their own dealings with their own uh, mythical beings. It sounds like a really strong belief. We continue to look forward to every time our stories are read or told, we also have a special attention given to the speaker. Any more questions? Um, the word zeal, to zeal, does it mean pleasure? Is that what it means? Slides in the mouth. Slides. Nice. Yeah, that was my question. So it slides every summer, and yet it never seems to diminish. <laughs> it doesn't diminish, and that's where the name comes from, slides in the mouth, because it slides almost every year, but uh, not this year, but last year it had a little bit of slides, but the year before, Many, 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 many yeah. slides. Yeah, for long and periods of time. Long periods of time, but the, uh, the rock is not the hard rock. As you've seen in the video, the video I think was taken from up, up here somewhere, and it was uh, taken across the valley, and you could see the big boulder. The, the big boulder was about that big, and then it tumbled down the, the, the chute, and when it hit the bottom, it exploded. So that's why we don't have any big rocks that come in, into the valley. When they come down with such great force, they break themselves up. And the, to present the story of uh, put in the bell, this bell is still in Mount Creek today, and it was uh, purchased in the interior, I'm not sure where, but to get it home to Mount Curry, they they hired a wagon, canoes on Anderson Lake, and Seaton Lake, and they brought it in by wagon from Kamloops, stopping at each native village, and they offered 
five cents, ten cents to see if a man could come with a sledgehammer, smash that thing in half, <laughs> which he didn't. He just made a big gong, and so that's how they uh, they raised funds for their journey to get the the bell home. And in the 1960s, the bell was loaned to Whistler Village, and uh, they used it in Creekside, and they used it to announce the, the start of uh, ski lessons at the at the gondola when that was the, the single gondola that was there. Now it's moved back down to. Now it's moved back down to the road. ranchery. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, ranchery. Maybe explain what it's used for now. Well, the bell today is used for, like, a, every time one of our members uh, passes away, they they'll ring the bell to uh, alert the general public. Other than the death, we also use it to alert the public, not only the native nations but also the local non-natives that live around the, the story area in Mount Perry. That is when the Capricorn Creek came tumbling down in the big flood. And that is a warning for all people, not just the little people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do people still get it with a sledgehammer? Yeah, they could if they won't break. <laughs> it does have a crack on it though. Yeah, <laughs> but not, not from the sledgehammer. And there's a designated bell ringer Yes, there's a designated bell ringer, and not just any native man will go and ring the bell. He's, he's been appointed, and he's been carrying out the service for about 20 years, and we hope he continues. Any more questions, last round? I'd like to thank you people for showing a great interest in our culture, and I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you.